Have you ever wondered how we should live our life knowing that John 3.16 is what God thinks about us? That's what we'll talk about today. Though we are incomplete, God loves us completely. Though we are imperfect, He loves us perfectly. Though we may feel lost and without compass, God's love encompasses us completely. He loves every one of us, even those who are flawed, rejected, awkward, sorrowful, or broken. Dieter F. Uchtdorf Today we're going to talk about the book 316, The Numbers of Hope by Max Lucado. I have this problem when it comes to books that are very popular. As soon as I see everybody's buying a book, no matter what it is, I feel like I don't want to read it. I don't know what that is. As soon as everyone started reading Harry Potter, I was immediately against it just because everybody was reading it. (laughs) I've grown in the past few years. I found out sometimes there's a fantastic reason why everyone is reading a book because it's fantastic. At the time the book 316 came out, I saw it in every Christian bookstore, and everybody was talking about it. So immediately, old Jill said, hmm, I'm not going to read this book. I didn't really know who Max Lucado was, but since then have come to really love almost everything Max Lucado says. He's the kind of guy who can teach you that God just wants to put his arms around you and comfort you, be there with you. You know, I think what's interesting is sometimes I see criticisms of this pastor or that pastor. Oh, well, he's always talking about purpose, or he only ever talks about God's love. What about the other stuff? I am willing to bet that just like 2 Corinthians, where it says that we are different parts of the body of Christ, elbows and eyes and knees and toes, that pastors are like that too. Some of them are very good at one thing. My pastor who baptized me was amazing explaining how God works to people who were very skeptical, to be kind, angry, bitter, resentful towards God. He knew all the standard arguments, the things that you say to atheists. I always think it's interesting because every once in a while when I'm looking at Twitter, I will see someone who is an atheist say, oh, yeah, well, did you ever think about how all the animals got on the ark? Yeah, you know, Pete, we've, we've talked about that before. We know, we know. So my pastor was great at that kind of thing. He was very good at talking about what people had questions about. And when I was an atheist, I had a lot of questions. So he answered me very well. In this case, like I said, Max Lucado is about God's love. God's grace, the Holy Spirit, the things that God does for us, thinks about us, and the reasons why God loves us. So if you ever need to pick up in life, Max Lucado is your guy because he will make you feel loved by God, which you should feel. He says that he's long fascinated with the Bible, and in particular, John 3.16. How could a single sentence be bigger, more consequence for everything? God, love, world, perished, eternal, life. Those are what he pulls out of those words. And in the course of this book, he's going to talk about all of them. He says, quote, John 3.16 does for the human heart what my coach attempted to do for my golf swing. It invites us to get to the root of the human story. We tend to do the opposite. We focus on the fruits. So he's going to do a deep dive into this one Bible verse because it's so important. And what does everything mean? So that's what he's going to do. He's going to go through this piece by piece. And then he said we can even bring it into phrases. He loved, he gave, we believe, we live. Simple. And those words are so relevant and so stunning, even though they were written 2,000 years ago. So what I find interesting about the Bible and historical documents, sometimes are rough. Sometimes people are pretty blockheaded, you know, maybe feeling not sophisticated. But when you look at the Bible, it is a piece of art. It is written in a way that can take a very big concept and mesh it in together to explain exactly what it is God thinks about us. It is sophisticated. And whatever else you think about the Bible, it is an amazing piece of literature that we should know. 
He talks again about Nicodemus. Again, I'm having a Nicodemus thing lately, and all the books I'm reading also are having a Nicodemus thing. But he picks it up where Nicodemus is looking across the roofs, and he's thinking about Jesus. He goes to the courtyard. He goes to the teachers. He does what he does every day. You know, he sits among a team when it comes to the temple and all the day-to-day things. So how should we feed people? What is the nature of divorce? You know, all the different topics that the leaders of the temple would be discussing, debating, pondering. And he was right there with it. He's one of them, and he probably had all of those debates many times. He's supposed to be a scholar. He's supposed to be an educated man. And he's one of 71 people on this what Max Licato calls a Judean Supreme Court. But there he is, watching Jesus. He's seeing that Jesus does all these different things. He witnessed Jesus getting whipped. He noticed Jesus being tortured. He heard all the things that Jesus said. And he also understood what the temple court, the Supreme Court, understood about Jesus. Yet here was by all accounts, probably an unlearned man, at least when it compares to Nicodemus, a non-trained man. He was supposed to be Nicodemus, the guy who makes miracles happen, the person who heals people, the people whose prayers are heard by God. And yet, when he watched all the people come to Jesus, sitting at his feet, this guy doesn't have the education. It doesn't matter who he is. And yet, Jesus came to him and said, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Boy, that right there is exactly where Max Lucado says that we split between the scholars and between what Jesus is saying. That is a huge statement because the temple priests were saying, I'm very educated. I do everything I can to learn about God. I have the tassels on my clothes. I have the mezuzah on my door. I am doing everything. And not only that, I am helping all those poor, uneducated people do everything too. And here, Jesus is coming out and saying, nope, none of that works. You have to be born again. In the world of the temple, (laughs) the world we live in and the world we've had in the past, action, behavior is everything. Being sincere, being a hard worker. And then Jesus comes along and says, nope, your work doesn't matter. Nothing matters. You have to be born again. Born again? What do you mean born again? Are we going to go back in, you know, and Max Lucado says we're going to rewind the tape and start all over? There's no way we can be born again. And I've heard that too. I grew up as an atheist and I used to hear my dad make slams about it. Born again, that word doesn't even make sense. I think that people understand what it is Jesus is trying to say, because in the end, we want a second chance. But when you're an educated person, a smart person, you know you can't be born again. And then Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God must have been stunning to him. What does that even mean? We don't do any of those things. Are you telling me in this whole history of what we've been supposed to do and been doing, now you're saying the rules have changed? But Jesus was bringing out to them that works don't matter. Sacrifices never matter. The part of it is that Jesus wants our salvation to be done by Jesus on the cross. And in order to get that salvation, there's something else that has to happen. Max goes into some of the actual translations of the word. We talked about translations before. It's really hard to do. But a lot of the words in there, one of them was palin, which means the repetition of an act. Anothen, which is also a repeated action, but the original source of the action must do it. So if God does all the work, That means that repeated action also has to come from God. And that's the word that Jesus chose. If God caused us to be born in the first place, it's going to cause us to be born again and restored to what God intended us to be. So when we say that God loved, the next question is, what is the world? The world is everything. We have 
the entire world. We are part of the world. All the history, the problems, the abuse, the love, the bad things, the good things, the wars, the world. That's everything. Whoever, he says, is a universal word. And perish means we're going to be deleted. We're not even going to be there. Then the next part of it is born again. And he says, in the end, Jesus was the first to be born again. We get to see it actually happen. And he says we're so flawed. Our negativity, our sin, the fact that we're just thinking about hamburgers, trying to take a nap, that we have these short lives. How can that compare to what God does? His sinless activity, his world creations. And God is so great that how can this be good news for us? How can he even know that we exist? And instead, we know he is. We know in Romans 8.31, he says that if God is for us, who can be against us? So at the same time, God is powerful. God is amazing. God is the creator of everything. We have to hear that he loves us and we should believe in him, that we shouldn't reject the love, the listening, the words that God says to us. I knew as an atheist that Christians said that God loved you, that we should go and sin no more. It didn't mean anything to me. And I wasn't going to believe it. And I rejected it my whole life. When I became a Christian, it was God's work. And God was there to make his love apparent to me. One of the things that struck me at last week's sermon about Ruth and Boaz is someone said that when God made promises of the fulfillment of Jesus throughout the entire Old Testament, it shows that God keeps his promises, and we should take a lot of comfort in that. But what I thought was interesting is God is also going to help us even if it takes 800 years to do it. That God's plan to save us, to be there for us, to love us, can start a thousand years before we're even known to him. That should be comforting, that the plan for us has not happened when we were born, has not happened since we had our last bad turn with health or bad job incident. His plan for us, his love that he is going to show us, has been in the work since the beginning of time. And he says that we don't have to be afraid because God will not tire of us. We're never going to lose him. Our sin cannot corrupt him. And if God can make the whole universe, everything in it, I think, again, like I said, I'm amazed at the systems God creates, not just the things that he makes. Of course, he can help us too. If he is God, the person we worship, then we know that we can trust him to meet every need because he can make everything happen. He brings up this interesting point. We talked about this when we talked about Exodus, about how the people of Israel saw amazing things. They were let go of Egypt. They were released out of the system. The Red Sea or the Reed Sea split, took out the Egyptians. I mean, miracle after miracle. The manna pancakes, the manna hamburger, all manna all the time. All these miracles happened. The pillar of smoke, the pillar of fire. And then Moses goes up has a meeting with God, and the people start panicking, and they start making golden calves. I mean, it's ridiculous that all these years and all this travel, God has been faithful to people, and then all of a sudden, they're like, wow, well, we haven't seen Moses in a couple days. Let's go start worshiping idols. And the golden calf is interesting. When I was in Israel, I heard a lot of skepticism when it came to the golden calf. We've never even found one. It's such a made-up thing in the Bible, and yet, The year after I was in Ashkelon, I think it was a year after, maybe it was two years after, they found a golden calf. Well, a metal calf. But that showed that people used to do this. Worshiping idols, that's a big part of life that has been that way through humanity. And it's interesting, too, because we can live a life where God protects us, shields us, is there for us, loves us. And then the second something goes wrong, maybe we're not making golden calves. But maybe we're saying, hmm, I better do something, maybe something illegal to bolster my money because it looks like I'm in for a bad turn, probably going to lose my job. So if I steal this money to keep my family eating, I think I'm going to do that. Again, not a golden calf, but it's certainly money. Or we might do something else to try to 
well, God's going to save me, but I'm going to help out a little. There's always that joke about the person, and I think I heard it from Max Lucado. I hope stealing jokes is not a sin. But a fellow was on an airplane, and he's flapping his wings, and the stewardess says, what are you doing? I'm flapping the wings. I'm helping the plane flight. He says, well, you don't have to help the plane fly. It will fly in its own. Well, I'm just here just in case. And that's, in a sense, how we treat God. We're always flapping our arms just in case we need to do something. In the end, Max Lucado, because this is the kind of guy he is and why I love him so much, he said that worshiping a God was, quote, utterly foolish. Get it? Utterly. Who doesn't love a good cow joke? So it's hard because these people were supposed to be worshipers of God. They saw the miracles firsthand, and there they were. They hardened their hearts against God. They had no sense of embarrassment. It was terrible what they did. He said that when we have a hardened heart, we become, quote, hopelessly confused, minds of darkness, have no sense of shame, live for lustful pleasures, and practice every kind of impurity. When our hearts turn away from God, these are the kinds of things we do. And there was a recent thing. We're having a drought right now where I'm living, and it's pretty significant. Someone did this experiment where they took a glass of water, and they showed a very wet lawn. Turn the glass upside water, the ground soaked in and just soaked up the water. Okay, regular summer lawn, neither dry nor wet. Turn the glass of water over, go, 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 go. water runs out into the grass. Then the third image was of this very drought-stricken land. The ground was hard, the grass was dead. You take a glass of water and you turn it upside down on top of this grass, and the water bar- barely bubbled in. Bloop. And then 10 minutes later, bloop. The ground won't take up water once it's been hardened. And when I read this part of the book, that's what it made me see, is are your hearts too hard to take anything in? That's Mark eight seventeen, And that's the ground. <laughs> I looked at that and exactly right. The ground is too hard to take water in. Our hearts become too hardened to take the love of God in. He mentions, again, another theme in my life going on right now, how Hosea had to marry the prostitute, Gomer. And she went from one lover to another, shattered Hosea. He loved this woman and wanted her to love him. And when she was placed into a slave market, who was the person who bought her? Hosea. He still loved her no matter all the things she did. And that was what God was trying to teach Hosea, that your people treat me like this, like they go away from their love to prostitute themselves. And you know what? I still will go in and buy the people back no matter what happens. This was a sign of God's love. So then God ordered Hosea, start all over, love your wife again. Your wife who's in bed with her latest boyfriend, your cheating wife, love her the way I, God, love the Israelite people, even as they flirt and party with every God that takes their fancy. I think this is from the Message Bible. Tell that's the paraphrase. We talked about paraphrases. But that idea that God understands we're faithless, understands that we get our eyes turned like that one meme to another that is not meant to be. And again, it was very clear back in those days, you were worshiping Greek gods, Roman gods, Aramean gods, Babylonian gods, all the different gods that were out there. But ours is a little bit more subtle. We have money and power and entertainment, and maybe our idol is just being a slouch on the couch watching TV. It is complete and utter laziness, the complete lack of desire to do anything. So our gods, our worship, our Gomer latest boyfriends don't have the name Moloch or Baal. Instead, they have a million names and they're harder to identify. But God loves us through the end and he wants us to come back. In this case, when the word love is used in this passage, it's called agape. He says, quote, agape love 
is an exercise of divine will in deliberate choice made without assignable cause, save that which lies in the nature of God himself. So agape is very special. It's a deep love. Why else would God come down here? He was in heaven. He was housed all the rooms and all the things that heaven had and decided to go and be poor, being born to two poorer families and doing all the human experience. And then the answer is that's because God loves us. All the pain, the suffering, the betrayal, his hometown trying to kill him, all of that is because of love. And he didn't love us to get anything. He didn't love us so that we would say, I love you back. You know, you've seen people who do that. I love you. Why didn't you say I love you back? God loves us in a way that we can't even imagine, that we cannot lose, and we cannot corrupt in any sort of way. Don't resist God's love. That's what Max says. With this kind of overpowering love, accept it. Do not reject his love. And the other part of it, too, is God loves us so much, he makes us a part of the plan. He makes us a part of the family. You've seen that when there were kids where Maybe the kid got a new bicycle for his birthday or the family got a new car or something. And the kid is like, I want to help. I want to help. Can I help put this together? And sometimes the parent will say, no, you'll just get in the way. I want to do it. But God never says that. He says, of course, I want you to be a part of the story. I want you to be a part of this. God could do anything he wanted, but our membership in his family means that we're a part of all the things he's trying to do. So my challenge to you is think about the words in John 3.16 and what kind of an impact does that have on your life? It's easy to poo-poo or sort of forget about John 3.16. We see it so much in popular culture, but it is that significant. That guy who used to be at sports stadium with John 3.16 signs, he had it right. This is the most significant passage in the entire Bible because it sums up everything. So think about John 3.16 and what it means for your own life. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com, also on Twitter. Or if you have any prayer requests, anything like that, I'm happy to pray for you. So just let me know what it is I can pray for you. And remember that Jesus is the way to heaven. And this does not start with small steps, but one gigantic step that Jesus accomplished for us.